Thanks, Alejandro. Thank you to the Clinton School for having me here. Uh, the constructive dialogue for my part has already begun. I've enjoyed the hour that I've spent in your state so far. I want to open with a quotation here. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. This quotation from a Robert Heinlein novel articulates a philosophy diametrically opposed to most of the uh, national public service programs that America has implemented over the past century. Since the early 20th century, president after president has come forward with a vision for an unemployment relief program, a poverty fighting program, or some other kind of public work program. Over the years, we have tried to grow more humane, more sophisticated. We've evolved from the Spartan work camps of the Depression to the noblesse oblige of the Teach for America pro uh, programs. Yet at no point in this development have we departed from the core philosophy behind these programs. On the surface, it would seem that Herbert Hoover's economic recovery program and Bill Clinton's AmeriCorps have little to do with each other. It would seem that, in fact, the first is about putting the unemployed to work, and the second is about giving dedicated specialists an opportunity to serve full time. But in reality, all these programs have had the same broad purpose, served by the same means. These are illustrated well by the Serve America Acts passed by the Senate last week. It has been criticized by some conservatives as an unprecedented intrusion by the federal government into what they see as a fundamentally private sphere, the nonprofit sector. But in reality, while Serve America is indeed big, and it may have far-reaching consequences for good or bad, it's very much in the same mold as the previous programs we've seen. Because fundamentally, its broad purpose is to solve national problems and its means are the funding and, in some cases, organization of the workers through national government programs. The rhetoric to this effect has been consistent. When he founded AmeriCorps, President Clinton called it nothing less than the American way to change America. President Obama has called us to stand up together and answer a new call to service to meet the challenges of the new century. The goal has always been changing an entire country. And so the means are always national in nature. That's why I say the programs are antithetical to Heinlein's statement that specialization is for insects. Think about how an anthill works. What matters is the whole anthill. Each ant only has value as a part of the hill. Some ants are worker ants who exist to gather the food. Some ants are the queen ants who exist to lay eggs to continue the anthill. Others are male ants whose only job is to mate with the queen and then die. I suspect the last part was Betty Friedan's favorite thing about anthills. The anthill system is highly centralized, with each occupation being a specialized part of the system that is coordinated from a center that most of the ants have never seen. Over the course of the 20th century, human governments have started to work more and more like anthills. And this is what Heinlein was criticizing. While that way of doing things was often more efficient, Heinlein saw a soulless aspect to it that robbed humans of their very humanity. In an anthill, you don't think about areas of the anthill. You don't think about individual ants. There is only the whole, and each part only has value as a part of the whole. That works well for anthills, but I don't think it works well for humans. More importantly, I think it is opposed to the very nature of how a public service program ought to operate. Cicero wrote that the nature of a human was to seek not just survival, but beauty, loveliness, harmony in the visible world, both within himself and with other humans. A normal person, unlike an ant, has a diverse set of skills, interests, and needs unified into one body and mind. This is the natural beauty of the human being. The simultaneous unity and complexity, stillness and motion. A person's life, and especially his service of others, is an intricate and constantly changing web of relationships, activities, and interactions. Public service programs have to do justice to that truth, to the way humans work. 
If they don't, if they treat him as a specialized part of some kind of anthill, it won't work well. Specialization is for insects. <clears throat> we don't need anthill-sized public service. We need human-sized public service. Human-sized public service. Doesn't mean individualistic. Doesn't mean let's keep the government out at all costs. It's a mentality that works in proportion to the human lifestyle and psyche. So the human doesn't get lost in his environment the way an ant gets lost in an anthill. Think about architecture. What is a human-sized building? It's not a porta potty It's one that makes an individual feels comf feel comfortable by communicating to him through aesthetic features, through layout, etc., that he has value. The building we're in is a human-sized building. It has federal-style architecture that's designed to reflect the beautiful proportionality of the human body. It's human-sized. If you look at some of the office buildings in Little Rock or any other city, many of them are not human-sized. Story upon story of concrete blocks. We need to think about public service in these same terms. We need to think about it in a way in which normal people are valuable and needed and know it. I'm not here this afternoon to suggest a one-size-fits-all solution. Part of the problem with many of the current programs is they try to do exactly that. I would, however, like to discuss three things with you. First, I want to talk about how our understanding of public service has changed over the years. Second, I want to look at why our current understanding, the understanding that Heinlein criticizes, is inadequate to meet the challenges of today's world. And finally, I want to draw from that experience a few principles that can help us approach the public service question in a way that produces results. So what do we mean when we say public service? A couple months ago, I was at a panel at the Hudson Institute in DC. Shirley Sagawa was there. I think she was here a few weeks ago, along with three other leaders in national service. They argued about a lot of things, a lot of details. But between them, between the four of them, they only presented two philosophies. The first was, government is the solution. The other was, no, government is the problem. The anthill perspective and the individualist perspective. Each side was thinking about something totally different when it used the term public service, and no one even seemed to notice. The anthill side thought public service meant working for a government program. The individualist side thought it meant helping your neighbor mow his lawn once in a while. I'm going to lay a card down on the table right now and say I don't think either understanding is adequate. I agree with President Obama that public service should be a part of every citizen's everyday life. But I don't think it's something only specialists do full-time, like in AmeriCorps. And I don't think it's something that's only done through the federal government. Both are anthill solutions. <coughs> President Obama and I agree also that there was a time when public service was a common practice in America. But we disagree on what went wrong and how to fix it. Because we have entirely different understandings of the meaning of the term public service. In order to grasp why, we have to look at a couple moments in time when that understanding, the understanding of that term, changed. These two moments will help us explain the disconnect at the Hudson panel and allow us to consider why our current national service programs, even with the Serve America expansion, are not enough for today's problems. So first, the end of the 18th century. At the time of the American founding, there were two understandings of the term public service, shaped by developments on two sides of the Atlantic. The first development began in France, 10 years before George Washington was born. At this point, France was still a feudal society where localities were governed by the local nobility and operated by tenants and guilds. There were a number of problems with the system, as you might imagine. They are a topic for another lecture. But for now, I want to focus on the fact that each local economy was a human-sized environment. Even as a lowly peasant working the land, you could look around, you could see your support system. The noble riding past was your governor. His guards protected you. Your neighbors in their various trades met your basic needs. And your family structure and the local church provided coherence and stability. You knew that your child would have the same support structure as he grew up. But in 1722, the royal treasury was low, and the king decided that a stimulus was needed. He authorized drastic measures to do away with this decentralized distribution of administration. Over the next several decades, he channeled more and more of the power of the nobility and the guilds into a royal council that answered only to him. Local areas ceased to be governed by the nobility and instead were run by bureaucrats called intendants, 
appointed by the council. The local bureaucrat was always from a different area than the one he governed to ensure that his loyalty was to the council and not to the people he governed. He controlled so many of the day-to-day -day affairs of the town that the nobles and guilds and civic leaders were essentially left without jobs. John Law, the Scottish controller general, remarked to a French friend, Believe it or not, the French kingdom is ruled by 30 intendants. Your parliaments, estates, and governors simply do not enter the picture. The effect of this was that the term public service changed in meaning. Everything was the business of the local bureaucrat and therefore the business of the national council. If you lived in France at this time, you found that the bureaucrat pretty much ran everything about your day-to-day -day life, right down to street cleaning and poverty alleviation. The day-to-day -day aspects of living in a community were outside your control. You might very well start to think community service wasn't your responsibility. And in fact, that is how the Frenchmen began to think. They lost all interest in local governments and maintaining their own community. They sat on their hands and waited for somebody else to pick up the mess. There's a building on fire, that's the bureaucrat's job to fix. So public service was associated with what the bureaucrats did. It was holding the national government position charged with civic maintenance. After a while, the bureaucrats started to notice that nobody cared anymore. They tried to get people involved again, but it was too late. Local positions and institutions had been robbed of their political relevance, so nobody wanted them. Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, it never occurs to anyone that any large-scale enterprise can be put through successfully without the intervention of the state. The inhabitant considers himself a kind of colonist, indifferent to the fate of the place he inhabits. The fortune of his village, the policing of his street, the fate of his church and his presbytery do not touch him. He thinks that all these things do not concern him in any fashion, and that, in fact, they belong to a powerful foreigner called the government. Tocqueville believed that this isolated individualism and public dependency were the main condition that made the chaos of the French Revolution possible. But for our purposes, it's enough to note that the French associated public service with national government work, something that a specialist, a bureaucrat, did as a full-time job, something detached from relationships and local conditions, which was not the responsibility of normal citizens. The other understanding of public service came from developments on the other side of the Atlantic, as tiny American settlements spread into 13 colonies. The Americans rejected most of the problematic aspects of the feudal system, but they kept the localism, the human-sized nature of each person's environment. While their system was not always as efficient as the French centralized system, Tocqueville said that there were political advantages that were much more important. He noted vastly lower poverty rates, greater levels of local civic participation, and here's the interesting part a much stronger sense of public service. The Americans were clearly doing something differently. What was it? Some of you have probably seen HBO's excellent miniseries on John Adams came out last year. I don't know if you remember, but in the first few minutes, especially for those of you who have not seen, the Boston Massacre occurs. John Adams is stabling his horse and he hears shouts of fire. He doesn't realize the shouts are about the riot. He thinks there's a building on fire somewhere. And what does he do? Remember what Tocqueville said the French did in this situation. They sat on their hands and waited for the bureaucrat to come fix it. What does Adams do? He doesn't shrug and go back in the house. He doesn't even call for the fire brigade. He grabs a bucket. He grabs a bucket. And he's not the only one. All his neighbors are doing the same. Now, don't forget, the Bostonians are troublemakers. They started the riot in the first place. Their leaders give incendiary speeches, they form subversive gangs such as the Sons of Liberty, and they toss other people's tea into the harbor. But something about the way they do things in Boston has given them a sense of ownership over their neighborhood. Something has made them all consider themselves public servants. What? Edmund Burke, a British politician at the time, who was an admirer of the Americans, thought he knew. He wrote, to love the little platoon we belong to in society is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. For the Americans, what cultivated their strong public dedication was meaningful personal and political relationships with other people around them. The French nation was only an idea, a huge foreign thing represented by government officials. The human-sized world that people actually saw every day was irrelevant to that. So the individual got lost in the bigness of it all. 
and he felt disenfranchised and apathetic. The difference wasn't a question of big government versus literal or limited government that we hear nowadays. It was a question of centralized versus decentralized distribution of responsibilities. In other words, it wasn't about what the government did. It was about who did it. The guy across the street or a faceless office 2,000 miles away. To a Frenchman, devotion to the public was a theoretical abstraction. But to an American, it referred to real people and real relationships. Home wasn't a government or a theoretical concept. It was civil society. It was a place, the people in it, and their human-sized life together. As a result, for the Americans, public service wasn't specialized government work. It was the process of turning a group of people into a community. As such, it required daily effort from everyone as part of their individual lives, not from a few instead of their individual lives. John Adams didn't become a public servant when he went to Philadelphia to serve in the Continental Congress. He didn't become a public servant when he was elected the second president of the United States. He became a public servant when he picked up that bucket. Now, it's obvious to you, probably, which of these two understandings of public service I would have preferred had I lived in 1776. America was dominated at the time by small towns, local communities, farmland, so the human-sized solution worked. But shortly after Tocqueville wrote his critique of the French society in the 1850s, things began to change. As the 19th century wore on, America grew larger. Her cities grew denser and more industrialized. Railroads connected the country in unprecedented ways. Thousands of immigrants were pouring in. Post-war racial issues lingered. And the neighborhood where everybody knew everybody became less and less common. Problems got bigger, deeper, harder to solve. In particular, Big business and big labor contributed to a lot of tension and contributed to the growth of the materialism and the increasing insignificance of the individual. In order to understand how best to appreciate and approach public service today, we have to grapple with this second moment in time in which America had to choose which of the two understandings it would take in the industrialized world. A number of intellectual leaders and eventually political leaders, <coughs> pardon me, including Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and author Herbert Crowley, believed that these huge economic forces were doing to people exactly what the French government had done to them. The special interests wouldn't leave you alone, even if the government did, so the government had to protect people's freedom by organizing the entire nation into a new, more efficient, centralized system. Wilson said that this new freedom, quote, consists in perfect adjustments of human interests and human activities and human energies by the government. Civil society was useful for the founders, but we needed something bigger for the modern world. This view became known as the progressive view. America wasn't fundamentally about people or relationships or institutions or self-government or a constitution. It was about an ideal, what Crowley in 1909 called the promise of American life. That promise was under attack by big business and big labor, according to Crowley, so we needed a government big enough to come to the rescue. Crowley said, it is obvious that the development in this country of two such powerful and unscrupulous and well-organized special interests, as corporations and unions, has created a condition which the founders of the republic never anticipated, and which demands as a counterpoise a more effective body of national opinion and a more powerful organization of the national interest." End quote. You might be wondering why Crowley and Wilson thought that a government bureaucrat was more trustworthy than a business or labor bureaucrat. And the answer lies in their conception of public service, which was similar to the French one. To them, the public wasn't you, it wasn't your neighbors, it wasn't your town. Those categories were too small, too selfish. To overcome the petty selfishness of materialism and localism, we had to work for the national good, the public good. And since public service obviously couldn't be done through civil society if it was that big. It would have to be coordinated by the national government in a new bureaucracy. Motivated not by greed, but by public spirit. Much as in France, the abstract concept, the nation, was connected to the tangible program and carried out by specialists. Problem is, applying the French solution to our problem has made us follow a similar progression in my view. 
when our immediate environment is divorced from what governs the day-to-day -day affairs of our lives, we stop caring as much about our immediate environment. When public service is something specific people do through temporary work in a government or government-sponsored position, after a while, most other people just, to, just start to mind their own business. Instead of rolling up our sleeves and working to fix our communities, we turn to the bureaucrats and scream for national solutions because we've all been taught that our problems are national problems. And then we wonder why President Obama says that we are too individualistic and selfish. This is the challenge we face today as present and future public service leaders. Too many Americans act as though they are self-sufficient, when in reality their dependency is just on something farther away, something that doesn't have a human face. When people's environment is no longer human-sized, when there's nothing to connect them with each other except abstractions and ideologies, then all a bureaucracy will do is reinforce their belief that they have no responsibilities to other people. And when that is the case, it's hard for us to motivate these Americans to get out and serve their communities because they've forgotten what a community is. There's only the anthill and the lost millions of ants. Thankfully, public service is not an isolated problem in this state of affairs. There are a number of other aspects of the anthill lifestyle that have become problems, and in some of these areas, people are beginning to try new ways of doing things. And in a lot of cases, the new way turns out to be suspiciously human-sized. Here's an example. The physical design of our cities. After World War II, the progressives in political power could turn their attention to domestic affairs, such as cities. Post-war city design was based on the principles of large scale and specialization. In fact, on socialist city designs from Eastern Europe. In this formula, the city is divided into zones. And you have the concrete high-rises for the rich over here, the concrete high-rises for the poor over here, the shopping district over here, the buildings where everyone works over here. It's all spread out and specialized. You might recognize this design because most major US cities adopted it in some form or another. The architectural idea is the same as the political idea. Make it big, make it specialized, make it efficient. The problem we discovered over time was that this wasn't a human-sized environment. People felt lost in these huge cities. They became increasingly dependent on things, on programs, and on the government. If you were poor and you lived in, over here, what connected you with the rich person who lived over here? It wasn't as if you were neighbors in any meaningful sense or that you had any responsibility for the dirty block on which your apartment happened to be located. You looked after yourself, and the government looked after the rest, or tried. People flocked to the suburbs where it was clean and safe. The American dream became owning a suburban home with a car, insulated from public problems. The American city was at best a necessary job stop for college grads on their way to a better life somewhere else. Then we realized we don't really like living that way, and we tried something new. Today, many American cities are enjoying a revitalization thanks to post-progressive urban redesign and crime-fighting policies. The physical city itself is redesigned in a less specialized form. Grand Rapids, Michigan, for example, has given its downtown area a makeover. It has pedestrian-friendly brick walkways, lots of trees and gardens. It has an open area theater, intimate shops, outdoor restaurants, and apartments over the restaurants where people actually live and work in the same area. In other words, it's designed to reflect the fact that it's a neighborhood where human beings actually live, not just sleep or work. The city is treated as a community of communities instead of a massive anthill. Local police officers build relationships with local citizens, much as General Petraeus' troops did so successfully in Iraq. So it's my friend Officer Wilson as opposed to, oh no, the cops. The result is a safer, cleaner, more intimate city in which people actually want to live and work. And what's odd about this model? It's the model that we used in Europe and America for hundreds of years before we stopped thinking in human-sized terms. Another example, you may be more familiar with this one. Think about a household pantry in the mid-20th century. It's the era of Wonder Bread. Almost everything is canned, mass-produced, and has more man-made ingredients than natural ones. This is the modern way to live. Cheap food for everyone. Centralize it all in a big plant, produce it cheaply, then add artificial preservatives and spit it out for people to eat several weeks and several hundred miles later. Bigger is better. It doesn't matter if we put lots of local farmers out of business. It doesn't matter if we don't even know anymore where our food came from. Food's just fuel anyway, right? Let's inhale it at a fast food joint 
just like we would refuel our cars and get on with life, whatever life means. Except then we started to figure out that most of the food didn't have any nutritional value. Some of it was horrible for you. Turns out the food that is best for you is the food that's fresh and natural. Turns out an apple straight off the tree tastes better than an almost artificial waxed one. Turns out when we sucked all the whole grains out of Wonder Bread to make it last longer, we sucked out all the things that made our bodies work. So we tried something new. And today we see an increasing demand for food that is organically grown, that's grown locally, keeping local small businesses going, getting us high quality healthy food. This is more of a middle to upper class trend, but the high demand plus modern technology are making it increasingly affordable. Even fast food chains have been forced to serve food fresh, not frozen. What's odd about this trend? These organic, locally grown foods that are so popular with trendy types? They're what people 200 years ago called our dinner. They're just fancy names for normal, natural, healthy food that people ate for centuries before we stopped thinking in human-sized terms. You see, just as a man won't fit in clothes designed for an insect's body, he won't live well in a world designed for an insect's lifestyle. The trend in many areas is away from anthill living and towards more humane living. And if our solutions for public service problems continue to be anthill in scale, they will continue to be inadequate at best and harmful at worst. To address today's problems, we need to think in human-sized terms. That doesn't require us to make things up from scratch. It only requires us to think creatively about things the human race has already learned a long time ago and subsequently forgotten. We've already started doing that in city design, in crime fighting, in business, in eating, in many other areas. It's time we started applying these lessons in public service. At this point, you may be wondering why I'm sitting here talking about Grand Rapids and Wonder Bread when I should be laying out for you concrete ideas for how to foster public service in a human-sized way. But that's just the point. Herbert Crowley would say that the possibility of human-sized life is past. That it happened once in history and can't be reborn. But these very examples of living and eating reinforce the fact that we are talking about permanent truths grounded in human nature. And they are just as true now as they were a century or ten centuries ago. Human beings still like to live more or less the same way. T.S. Eliot said that men like Crowley were, quote, encouraged by superficial notions of evolution which became, in the popular mind, a means of disowning the past. And as a result, they had the experience, but missed the meaning. A century of progressive politics has taught us the hard way that there was some meaning to our earlier experiences. That, in fact, America is not so simple that we can treat it like a big, centralized anthill and fix everything. America is a community of communities, human-sized communities. When we treat it that way, we thrive. But the longer we treat it like an anthill, the more people get the message that they are supposed to act like ants. To save public service, we need to restore an understanding of what the public really is, your neighbor. And we need to restore an understanding that what service really is can be done with your own two hands, not just your taxes. This isn't an argument against government. It's an argument against the ant hill approach to government. You see, these may be permanent truths, but they need to be applied by people in each community, in each era, in the context of each place's local culture and conditions. There isn't a universal solution. If you've been raised in the progressive mindset, this is difficult to swallow. Last week, as the Senate was debating the Serve America Act, I spent a lot of my time in and out of Senate office buildings. And I can't tell you how difficult it was to get most of these senators to realize that there really are problems in the world that can't be solved from the U.S. Capitol. It couldn't be fixed by making more bureaucrats. It couldn't be fixed by making the anthill just a little bigger. Specialization is for insects. If we want to see a real revival of public service, in America, we need to st stop thinking about a revival of public service in America. We have to start thinking about a revival of public service in your household, in your neighborhood, 
in your district, in Little Rock, in something that has a recognizable human face, or could have one again if we gave it a try. Thank you. Okay, let's start the dialogue. Mr. Stokes. Thank you so much for speaking here today. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Representative Mickey Edwards, <clears throat> who, as you know, was an instrumental in founding the Heritage Foundation. Uh, and he, he basically suggested that the Republican Party was off messes with its core, with its core values where it started. Um, do you see that in public service as well, or do you even see public service in terms of party? I don't see public service in terms of party, but political ideology, as I've tried to say today, does shape how we think about what public service is. Uh, is the Republican Party off base as far as the issue? I don't think the Republican Party right now realizes what its base is. Um, the only reason there was any debate over the Serve America Act last week at all was because one guy called up a couple of Senate staffers and said, hey, this bill's about to pass. Shouldn't we talk about it? And I was at that meeting, and one person in the meeting had actually read the bill, all 320 pages of it, cover to cover. One person. And ultimately, I think six or seven made coherent arguments for why certain things in the bill should be changed, all of which were voted down. So does the Republican Party is it off base as far as public service? I think it is. Is it a party issue? Only insofar as political parties represent ideologies, which in this case, they don't always do. Questions? We have many small towns in Arkansas that fit with some of the things you're talking about, where you have neighbors, you have people who grow their own food, <clears throat> you have a volunteer fire department, and many of those communities have trouble surviving. They have trouble in terms of getting enough jobs for the people who are there. So I think there's another layer of something that we need from our bigger government than uh, some of the things that you're talking about, which we recognize are good, but which have a hard time succeeding in today's world. Sure. Uh, the first question there is, if there is a role for something bigger, do we jump straight from the local city to the federal government? And the American Federalist system was designed so that if the city doesn't have enough, you turn to the county. If the county doesn't have enough, you turn to the state. And only when all else fails do we turn to the federal government. And the reason for that is, as I'm sure you know, when, your, when all your city's problems are quote unquote solved by, without using the community itself, when you have no sense of ownership over the improvements that your community is seeing, people stop caring about the community. So that's, that's the first point. The other point is there's also a, a very healthy private sector that I think has, in some respects, misdirected its philanthropy. Um, it's, it's very chic to help, let's say you're a rich businessman, it's very chic to help with AIDS in Africa. It's not so chic to help with the town you grew up in. And speaking as someone who went to an Ivy League college, it's also not chic as an Ivy League student to help a local town, to help your own family. It's chic to go to Beijing and help poor people there or teach English or something. So part of the problem is that we have in fact started thinking in such large, such unhuman sized terms that the people who are in a position to help are not helping to the degree that they could. But one other thing I would say to that is that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville actually made the same observation that you did, that in France with the centralized system, they were more efficient in some respects. And there were some small towns that suffered a little bit less, materially speaking, from federal aid, or it was national aid, they had no federal system. Um, 
But he said, having seen that and having seen America, he still preferred the American system. And the reason for that was there, was there were political advantages that outweighed any material advantages. That a town that was not doing as well materially was still preferable to a prosperous French town if its citizens cared about the community, if they had relationships with each other, if they participated in their own self-government. Question. First off, thank you for coming. We uh, appreciate your talk today. Thank you. Speaking to the point that you just made about using an example of helping in a small town versus going to Beijing and, and perhaps that, um, that dichotomy of experience that, that, that you framed it as, what would you say to those that might suggest that um, with short-term experiences like that, perhaps going to Beijing for a summer, that, that more things happen to you than through you, that it's not purely an empirical assessment of, hey, what did you do in Beijing and what did you not do in your small town, but, but to those that suggest that that individual going to Beijing perhaps is now equipped with an awareness, a perspective, a context of himself or herself and the world that then can equip them to come back and help the small town that without that experience, they may never have had that, that perspective. Uh, do you see that there's value to that as opposed to viewing it in such a, a, a cut and dry kind of way? Definitely. Um, Shirley Sagawa and Les Leskowski have done some writing that questions the degree to which we can empirically prove, say, that participation in an AmeriCorps program makes you more likely to go help, you know, serve on your own later. Um, because it's difficult to measure because the kind of people who would get involved in a program like that are the kind of people who are inclined to help anyway. Um, but I think you do see anecdotally people who do public service programs or uh, foreign service programs do find themselves changed by the experience. Um, often, if, often, often even just a week of humanitarian work in um, Central America or something has a huge impact. Uh, what I think we need to recover, if these programs are to have that kind of long-term impact, is a sense of place attached to the service. Because, speaking from my experience, those friends of mine who did charge off to Beijing or South Africa or several other places, while they were waiting to go and after they came back, they didn't live any differently. They minded their own business. They did their own thing. Then they went off and had this great service program. So service was something you went and did. And if these kinds of programs are to be helpful, I think they need to be done in a way that has a sense of place attached to it so that rather than thinking of public service as a specialized thing that you go off and do, you think of it as something, it's almost instinctual. You do it when you move to a new place you find out how you can get involved, because that is not an instinct that has been fostered very well in my generation. Hey Brian, let me ask you a question. Do you think AmeriCorps is a jobs program, or a service program, or both? And do you think people should be paid for public service? That's a loaded question. <laughs> Does Dean not get to do that? AmeriCorps it's difficult to say because AmeriCorps is, one of the reasons that the Serve America Act was brought up was because we have, we've had enough time to analyze AmeriCorps and find out what works and what doesn't. And one problem with AmeriCorps that was not fixed in the new legislation was that it is very, very lightly overseen as far as where the funding goes. Um, people have used their AmeriCorps funding to work for ACORN. They have used it to go stage political protests. They have used it to work for partisan political campaigns. They've, in, in many cases, not used it for the purpose it was intended for. So as far as is it a government jobs program or a public service program, it often depends on how the individual chooses to use it. And should they be paid? It's the purpose, I know, for, a, for, the, for the payment is not to make money off it. You don't get rich off these programs. Um, the purpose is to help you afford to be able to do it. Um, I don't think there is a problem with that. 
I don't, I don't personally have a problem with it. My concern would be where the money comes from. Um, there is a legitimate conversation to be had over how taxpayer dollars should be used. But for example, many privately run similar programs, such as those that many universities run, the students and the workers do get stipends. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything unreasonable with that, but we do have to ask, where is the money coming from and is it the best use of our resources? Questions? Right here. Right here, Bob. Thank you. Um, I personally find it pretty interesting that you use Burke and French system to argue for your case. Um, Burke obviously was a proponent of um, monar mo French monarchy and not and against French Revolution, the people who were oppressed, as you said, by the national government. But also, if you look at their tax records, which I had an unfortunate um, chance to have <laughs> chance of doing as a as a student. You look, at the, you look at the tax records, they're being charged for tools, local property owners, churches, and if you look at who they decided to guillotine, it's a lot of local landowners and churches. And I kind of find it odd that, um, well, in talks, you know, in talks with those um, wealthy Frenchmen who was able to come to the United States and would be, was able to actually look at the American system. My question is, and one of my comments is, what do, what do you, I find it a little ironic that you... That I'm using, that I'm holding up the French as the bad thing, but I also quoted Burke. Uh-huh, exactly. But, well, also because it's not as centralized as I, I think you make it seem as. I think one of the bad things about French system was that it was localized, and local people did run them over, and a lot of people decided to revolt, and that's why they didn't kill their friendly landowner next to them, who was not nice to them at all. <laughs> they decided to kill those off instead. I just, you know, I like the localism idea too, but it seems to me like churches and, um, churches could do a lot of good public service, but churches and property owners, sometimes they do use political power to strip public service programs away. And I really don't understand, you know, I think there has, it seems like there has to be a balance between localism and national, and not all local entities can be good all the time. Thank you. Definitely. Um, the, the, well, and, and, and that was reflected in the American system as well. You know, no one was claiming that a particular state was going to have a better system than, than you know, just as good a system as, as the next state. Um, the advantage was with originally 13 states, if you didn't like the state you were in, you could move to one that worked better. Whereas if the federal government isn't running it well, you're stuck. The, and, and actually, it's, it, I'm, I'm glad you made the observation about Burke and Tocqueville because, first of all, it allows me to make a book recommendation, which I love to do. Uh, many people who study politics in, in, in college have read Democracy in America by Tocqueville. Very few have read another book he wrote called The Old Regime and the Revolution, which is much shorter. And that's his, his critique of the French system. And in that critique, he, he explicitly refutes Burke. He agrees with Burke that abstract ideology was, was a, a major player in, in what went wrong in France. But he disagrees with Burke that it was just the French spontaneously deciding to blow up. He says that what allowed the French system to collapse the way it did was by sucking local institutions of their political relevance, the French grew to have not only a distaste, but a disgust for the local noble, because he was a relic. He's still there lording it over you, but he has no actual power. And that is what eventually allowed for the French Revolution as other institutions began to collapse. Um, yeah. Got a question right there, yes. Okay. Um we know that now is not like it was then. Okay, talking about de Tocqueville in France, that's interesting, but that's not now. And when we look at our cities now, and having grown up in a city, and going to public schools and public universities, and uh, knowing that even when we worked on local issues, because we had a volunteer, fire department also, 
in the city, in the neighborhood. I knew everybody. My mother never did learn how to drive. How can that be better, leaving it local, especially when you look at the education system? Because that is local. Only 17% of it's nationally funded. So 87% comes either from the district, the county, and the city, and the state. And when you go from neighborhood to neighborhood, you see a big difference in what is education. So how would you address that? That's, yeah, that's why I brought up the progressive question, because the, the issues the progressives were trying to confront have not gone away. Herbert Crowley, his, his two big criticisms were big business and big labor. And those are both still with us. And Crowley would say that a major problem with the, edu the education system is, in fact, the teachers' unions, which prevent local organizations or local communities from fixing their schools. I'm just telling you what he would say, because this is what he said about everything else. Um, the, the temptation when a problem is significant in modern society is to turn and scream for the government. And it's a human instinct. When, when we feel like things are out of our control, let's turn to the next step. Let's turn to something bigger that can help us out. The, the naivete I see in turning to the federal government is where's the evidence that the federal government can do it any better than we can? And once the federal government has gotten involved in something, it's very difficult, impossible, in fact, to get it out. Sorry, can you say it in the microphone? Okay. How do you get generational differences, political differences, and then locality differences? For example, if I go back and work in the inner city schools where, and I did, where I went to school, that's because I chose to go. How many kids that went to Princeton choose to do that? How many kids that even, let's say this, lived out on the island chose to come into the city? When you say everything should be local, you, you only have what's there. So I'm not saying national, but how do you get the people out how in you, the areas? Yeah. yeah, we were just talking about this. How do, you, how do you match the resources with the need? Yeah, and it's a, it's a very good question. And to be honest, I do think a lot of the problem is this, this national mentality we've been, we've been taught to think, and I mean national specifically in the sense of, of the government. Because speaking as someone who went to Princeton, yeah, we didn't want, a lot of us were interested in, in teaching, but none of us wanted to go to an inner city school to do it, right? We've been taught for four years, oh, you've been given this great gift, this amazing education, let's go out and save the world, right? Problem is, saving the world's pretty big. Saving the local community sounds very unheroic, unglamorous compared to the alternatives. So, you know, if, if, if you're one of the elite, quote unquote, what are you doing about these, these small communities? How do you get them? And that's where I think, for example, a Teach for America type program has been very successful. Um, and I think the next step would be, and, and this, again, this is an area where I think um, private philanthropy can be extremely helpful and, and more so than it has been because Teach for America was initially started by, actually by a Princetonian, but, uh, but you know, as, as a, a private organization that was incorporated into AmeriCorps. So what do you go from there? I think the sense of place is important. If, because when it, when, I mean, I grew up in California, there's no sense of place in California. All the towns are identical, the suburban strip malls, the whole nine yards. There's no reason for me to feel a sense of ownership over where I grew up. So a lot of it, I think, is going to come down to how we raise the kids. Question right here. All right, sir, thank you for, uh, thank you for coming here. I'm a student here at the Clinton School, and I just find it befitting to ask you what you think of public service as an educational pursuit. Uh, we're all here getting our master's of public service degree. We're gaining a lot of experience in the field and in the real world, in the local parts of, of the city, and, and how you see that as an educational pursuit. I think it's unquestionably an educational pursuit. One of the oldest understandings, going back to the Greeks, going back to even beyond the Greeks, one of the oldest understandings of the function of law and public service is that it has a pedagogical function. It has a role as, as, as habituating you in, in certain ways. So the education isn't simply 
It isn't simply the sum of our experiences, but neither is it simply reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's education has to include, it has to prepare you to be a member of society. And so that's part of what the uh, educational programs in the Serve America Act are designed to do, to give students uh, public service expo exposure. I have some criticisms of, of those particular programs, but the idea, I think, is good, that when you serve your community in particular, especially at a young age, it can help habituate you. This is actually following up, uh, sort of finishing answering your question. You know, what is, why is it that all these people that go to Princeton don't care to go back and fix up their local town? Uh, that's part of the reason. They have, they have been raised often in rich families where they've got, they went to the private school, they had their wonderful little training to go out and be famous, but what, what then? What about the town that gave them all that training to be famous? And it's going to be very important, I think, in the next couple of generations to see whether we can, as individuals, as parents, as educators, foster the spirit by raising a generation for whom serving their community is a normal thing that they grew up doing, that is instinctual to them, that they instinctively want to turn back to when they have been given great opportunities. George, you have a, somebody else have a question that hadn't asked one? Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Excuse me. Um, I had an observation, and I'm always struck by our academic uh, passiveness that we cannot seem to get away from. Mm. It's part of us. And in the land of much where we live, um, it's even harder to get out of that passivity. So, and we do look at the power throne in another place and forget really that the power is within us. We have the power. But as I teach my students in a community college here, I mean, knowledge is power. And my hat is off to the school and the knowledge that they provide. And for your being here too and giving us um, a chance to talk about these many things. But just an observation is when my students come into class, they come from different paths. Many of them are there through, with a GED in their background. Some of them come with a high school degree. Some of them have tried college and it didn't even work. So now they've come back for another attempt. But as we come in and we begin to study government and federalism and anti-federalism and those forces and the tension that is there, and we begin to talk about how knowledge affects us and what, what can we do, there is one of my students who's running for alderman in North Little Rock, which is close to here. I don't know if you've even heard about North Little Rock. It's part of this community. But anyway, he's running, and so their project now is to uh, do a campaign for him running a year from now. So we have teams in it, and you would not um, be surprised by the community that's been built in that classroom. Even though they don't live in North Little Rock at all, they are all working together, and there is power in the knowledge that they have and the ability to form community and to help. And now that they know their vote's important and their um, just service here is important. So it's been a thrill to see, but hats off here. We have time for one more question. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, right here at the back. Here you go, let's get your mic. Seems to me population growth we live closer together, we've got to have more and more rules, legislated, bureaucratic, and just cultural norms so we can stand each other. And I'm sorry, could you we'll all be a little closer around. to your mouth? I can't oh. hear you. With population growth, we're going to be living closer and closer together, which will require more rules, legislated, bureaucratic, just cultural norms so we can stand each other. And we'll all be worker ants. No uh, volunteerism, you do what you're told, I think. Yep, I, that's, that is the difficulty that, that urbanization brought in, in the late 19th century. Um, fine, we can do this whole public service thing when I know everyone on my street, we all, you know, there's, there's a, an accountability system built in, of course I need to help patch my neighbor's screen door, who else is gonna do it? But what about when we live in a city with eight million people? And, and that's why I mentioned the city example uh, as far as urban design, because when we treat cities as these huge masses of how can you have a sense of ownership in, in an environment like that? The, 
it, it's, very, it's not that it can't be done, but it's not easily fostered. And what we've seen done with a number of cities in recent years is going back to a pre-industrial way of, of viewing the city, which is as a community of communities. And Rudy Giuliani did this very well, not only with his crime-fighting policies, but with other policies in New York. And I'm not holding him up as a, a, an example of perfection, but he did do this particular thing well, which was fostering the sense of New York City, not as New York City, but as Harlem, as the different neighborhoods in the city. And if you go to many of the neighborhoods in the city, as actually especially the ones that aren't as well off, they have a very strong sense of this is our neighborhood. They have a very strong sense of this is our problem. This is, this is what we're going to work on. And <laughs> can, can I talk to you afterwards? Can we, yes, let's okay. talk. There are a lot of people that may want to talk, but let's give Brian Brown a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>